first speaker is Arnold de Mesme from SID and Alexander. And he's going to tell us about hard embedding problems in three dimensions. Okay, so it will be one, and then we will have to be invited to speak here. Uh, so we tell it based on joint works with many people, one of which is in the room. Uh, so this talk is about the computational complexity of topological uh, problems. So what do I mean by topological problems? I mean I well-defined discrete problems uh, for which we can expect the computer to give us a solution. So maybe the most iconic example here is standard recognition. Problem is you start with k on a diagram, and you want to know whether this not diagram represents the end not. And computational complexity is about studying how hard it is to solve such a problem. So one question is can we solve it fast with a computer? And if not, can we prove that we cannot solve it fast? Although say can we prove that it is hard. And the part of my talk today is to uh, show two problems uh, based on embeddings in three dimensions for which we can prove that they are hard. And uh, there are not that many problems for which we can do that in topology. But before uh, going into that, so for the mathematicians who are not that familiar with computer science, I will start with a very tiny bit of complexity theory that you understand what I'm talking about. So complexity theory is uh, the science of classifying problems into boxes, depending on how hard they are to compute. So the, the most important box maybe is P, it's the problems that can be solved in polynomial time. That means there exists some polynomial time algorithm to solve it. Can you write just a little bigger? Yes, sorry. There are many problems in there. For example, for topological problems, there are quite a few things that we can do in random time. Like, for example, computing homology, computing basic numbers. If I give you a surface, you can recognize the surface in random time because it's mostly just all that characteristic. And then I will also care about other problems, which are NP hard problems. <coughs> And for now, I will not define this exactly, but I, what I will say is that if they are NP-hard, it means that uh, there is no polynomial time algorithm to solve them. And so, of course, the current state of complexity theory is that we can never really prove something that's wrong, uh, because there are some Foundations that are lacking, so all these things are modulo some well known conjectures. So this one is modulo p not equal to mp. So if modulo some million dollar problem, uh, problem that is NP hard, uh, you cannot solve it efficiently. And I will just pretty much stop here for the background complexity theory. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, if you come from theoretical computer science, Pretty much every natural problem that you encounter, uh, you can either put it in here or in here. So you can either find some, some polynomial time algorithm to solve it, or you can prove that it's hard to so modulate this conjecture. Uh, so that's not really a theorem, it's more like a, a general phenomenon, and there are a few exceptions, but there are so few exceptions that actually they are famous. And in some subfield of theoretical computer science, like um, constraint satisfaction problems, for example, it's, it's actually a theorem that things are either here or here. And what I would like to look at is whether this kind of very nice specification applies as well for topological problems in three dimensions. And it turns out that it's really not the case. What are the most uh, famous 
topological problem. So, for example, unknown precondition. So, we might have the wrong impression from the software presentation yesterday that unknown precognition is easy, but it's not easy. Uh, so, it, it runs well on the genome, it's not here, but in practice. So, the best theoretical algorithm that we know to solve it is exponential time. This is the worst case, right? This is worst case. Yeah. yeah. Do we know something? Or mean? Or average case? Yes. Uh, well, then there's a big question about what is a random not diagram? What is a random and not diagram? Uh, it's the number of crossing and a random uniform number. Among all the and not diagrams, so ah, it's, it's yeah. hard to study uh, yeah. you know, which uh, diagrams are not this kind of thing. So maybe there are things to study, but it's uh, not that well defined. So I should say that I think Ben has a paper where he shows that his algorithm runs in practice in polynomial time. But the theoretical bonds are only exponential. Um, so if we have a problem for which the best thing we know is exponential, then we want to ask, well, can we prove that it's hard? Can we, can we prove that it's NP-hard? And for this one, it turns out that we probably cannot prove that it's NP-hard because it's in NP and co-NP. And I will not say what NP and co-NP means. I think we will need more about it tomorrow. What I will just say is that so it's something like here. about than this one. And problems that are in NP and co-NP are not NP-hard. Modulo some conjecture that is widely accepted, which is NP is not equal to co-NP. <coughs> so for this problem, uh, there's no chance of proving that they're hard. Uh, if we believe in natural conjectures. Um, so maybe we can look at harder problems if we want to prove some hardness things. Like there's three sphere recognition, and the situation is pretty much the same. So there's an exponential time algorithm, and it's, it's in NP and co-NP. So now the co-NP is only modulo some, I don't know if it's a harder conjecture or just another conjecture. Uh, so same thing, this one's, uh, from the point of view of honest, we are not going to say anything interesting. But so we can look at... And again, in practice, it's... In practice, it works well. well I mean, it, actually, it really depends. It, if you look at like a graph algorithm, this kind of thing, they consider that the problem runs well in practice if you can solve it when n equals 1 million, for example. While Regina and SnapD, I'm not sure that they work that well when n equals 1 million. They work quite well, but oh, there's a difference of perspective here as well. There was an interesting question, like... Give some hard examples. Even even if you need a lot of distribution, yeah. where do hard examples? So today I want to look at even harder problems. So maybe one harder problem that unknown recognition is not equivalence. I give you two knots, and I want to know whether they're the same knot. And so what do we know? Well, this one is decidable. You know for quite some time, but it's much worse than exponential time. And so. Is it in NP and co-NP? Well, I don't know. That's unknown. So maybe we can hope to prove that it's hard. So the harder a problem seems to be, the easier it should be to prove that it's hard. But that's unknown. Nobody knows. Uh, natural variant is a uh, stream manifold homeomorphism. So you start with two triangulated stream manifolds. So you want to know whether they're the same. And that's decidable, at least if it's closed and oriented. And I think it's folklore in the other cases, but it's never been written. And same thing, we don't know whether that one is hard. So this raises the question where can we prove that any problem in topology is hard? And it, for quite some time, there was pretty much a single problem for which we could prove that it's hard. It's not genus. <coughs> But not genus in a three manifold. So what is that problem? Well, you start with the knot K and a three manifold M, and you want to compute the genus of K in M. And for this problem here, so we have some exponential time algorithm based on normal surface theory. And 
This one we know to be NP hard. This is the result of Egol, Haas, and Selston. And maybe just to complete this picture, well, maybe we can look at even harder problems. So and maybe that would be even easier to prove hardest about. So maybe something that is even harder is the unknotting number. So this one is not known to be decidable. And same thing, we cannot prove that it's empty hard, so we cannot even rule out polynomial time algorithm. So the picture that emerges is that, uh, so there's been a lot of work, maybe in the past 20 or 30 years, on finding algorithms for all of these things. And there has not been that much work on finding hardness results, on proving that these problems really are hard, and we cannot solve them efficiently. And apart from this one, uh, there was almost nothing a few years ago. And in the last few years, there have been quite a, quite a few works on this kind of question. So for example, now we know that the, computing the Higgard genus is empty hard. And there have been a few other papers. And something that uh, is interesting in this, and that we can see here, is that, uh, for example, you could also ask, what is the complexity of computing the node genus in R3, which is the most natural setting where you want to compute the node genus. And then this reduction does not work. So many empty hardness reductions that have appeared use the fact that you use a, a complicated three manifold uh, to work, which means that they're never going to be really useful if you want to look only at not theoretical problems or link theoretical problems that live in R3. So most uh, hardness proofs do not live in R3. And I should say that there's been a paper by Lankenby like last year where I had a few hardness proofs in R3. But that's pretty much the only exception. So this is one of the reasons why uh, nothing that's theoretical is known to be hard. So what I want to talk about today is progress on these hardest questions on embedding problems. So what is a typical embedding problem? Well, uh, so as an input to your computer, I give you a k-dimensional Implicial complex. Um, an integer d. And maybe a d manifold. And I want to know whether uh, k whether k embeds into RD. Or maybe if I give, give you the three manifold, the empty manifold, I will ask whether it embeds into M. So that's a well defined problem, and uh, maybe, maybe let's say a bit why we, should, we could care about it. So there are two different perspectives. Either you care about K or you care about M. So if you care about K, uh, one variant for which this problem has been ex extremely studied is when little k equals 1, so now your simplicial complex is a graph. And you're trying to decide whether your graph embeds into, let's say, R2, so the plane, or embeds on some surface. And that's a very classical topic in graph theory, in topological graph theory, finding fast algorithms for these kind of things. That's something that has been very studied. Could you, sorry, could you write a little bit more in the parenthetical remark? Uh, so it's a k-dimensional simple complex and a number d. The number d and maybe some d manifold. Well, maybe a d manifold. Yeah. Or perhaps and then there are two problems: either yeah. you embed into R d or you embed into the d manifold. And so in the past few years, there have been some work trying to extend this theory of embedding graphs that has been very successful to higher dimensions. So there have been a, a whole lot of results on these kind of things, and the results really depend. Uh, in a very intricate manner of what, on what is the value of k, what is the value of d, and uh, these kind of things. Or you could also think of it as maybe, what, if you're a three manifold series, maybe what you care about is the three manifold m. And then uh, this problem is about finding embedded substructure <coughs> in m, 
which is basically what many problems in low dimensional <coughs> topology uh, are trying to do. If you're trying to solve another genus, you're trying to find some specific small genus surface into a manifold M. Maybe if you're looking for heterogeneous, you're looking for some specific surface as well that is embedded. Uh, it's interesting to look at complexes because the arch, I, I never know how to pronounce it, the archies are, uh, can be seen as simple shell complexes, this kind of thing. So that's quite a, uh, a general and natural problem. And what's interesting, so I said that there have been some works on this, and pretty much all the works uh, apply to high enough dimensions and break down when d equals 3. So the case of uh, embedding things in three dimensional space uh, has been very intricate and uh, requires some uh, different tools from what has been devised before. And there's been a, a very nice paper a few years ago from uh, Matushek. Tensor and Wagner. Well, they proved that embeddability of a two complex or a three complex in R three is decidable. And um, so this is based on a lot of normal surface theory and maybe harder variants of normal surface theory that what is usually seen. And in particular, the complexity in here is horrible. Like it's at least some tower of exponential, but it's, they didn't analyze it at all. And so this raises the question, once again, how hard is, how hard is that question? Uh, is the complexity is horrible? Maybe this is one of the problems for which we can prove that it's hard. And so that's what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about two results. So the first one is a bit different from this one. So the first one is that embeddability of the non-orientable surface of some specified genus in a three manifold is empty half. And the second one is that embeddability of a two or a three complex in R three is empty half. You can think of it not in terms of embeddability, but naturally, you start with a three manifold and you want to ask, well, does it contain some non orientable surface of this genus? Does it contain a claim bottle? That kind of thing. And this one, you can show that it's hard. And the second theorem is about showing that this one is hard as well. So the first theorem was uh, from a few years ago with Ben and Uli, and the second one is with Eric, Martin, and you have. Uh, all right. And so, this first theorem, it's uh, at least the, the initial steps are very close to Hegel as a system that I've referred to before. So the plan for the talk is to first present what Hegel has in system have been doing because I think it's a very nice production and uh, it's a quite intuitive picture to have in mind when thinking about these harness proofs and I will not give many details of the proof and then I will talk about the second problem. Well, I, what I'm really enthusiastic about is that this second problem is in R3. And I think that the technique that we developed for, to solve that problem can be used to prove hardness for other problems in R3. So for maybe a nothing number of kind of things. So let's start with one. Uh, so how do you prove that something is hard? Well, you prove that it's harder than some, yes? In theorem 1, what is varying? Is G fixed and you vary three manifolds, or so you vary both? Both G and the manifold are part of the input, which means that they both vary. Okay. Yeah. So in the hardness proof, they will both increase with, uh, with the inputs. 
Yeah, so I will try to go very slowly because uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that many mathematicians have never encountered this kind of thing before, and it's not that complicated if you take it slowly. So how do you prove that something is hard? You prove that it's harder than some things that you know is hard. So, yeah, so it's reasonable, right? So, maybe the mother of all the hard problems <coughs> is the satisfiability problems which is the following. So I give you the family of Boolean variables. So x1 up to xm. And each of these, they can either be true or false. And I give you a family of clauses. The first one generally is n, and the second one is n. And every clause contains three literals. And one is a literal, one well, is either a variable or its negation. So for example, a clause can be something like x1, not x2, and x3. And each of these is something like that. Maybe this one is x4, x5, and not x6. And you say that a clause is satisfied. If, uh, so here we will look at two variants. Uh, <coughs> one of the literals is true, or in another variant, exactly one of the literals is true. So this problem would be called right here. This problem is called 3 sats. This problem is called 1 in 3 sats. So then what is the problem? It's find truth values for all the variables, such that all the clones are satisfied. try to embed this problem into your topological problem. So for example, what does that mean? In our case, what Hegel has and Thurston did So you start from some satisfiability problem.
empty hardness proof work like that. Uh, when you're trying to figure out them to, to, to invent them, you're stumped. You don't know what to do. But when you have one in front of your eyes, then it's obvious that it works. So this is almost the case for this proof. So what do they do? Well, I'm bad at doing pictures, so then here. So they will first create some two-dimensional complex. So you start from some uh, instance, so you've got variables and you've got clauses. And you build the following two complex here, so it's just a sphere in which you drill out a small disk, and the boundary of this disk will be on that K. Now, for every variable, you will drill out a small disk as well, and for every clause, you will drill out a small disk, and then you will do the following. So, whenever you've got a, vari a literal that appears here, so for example here you've got x1 that appears in c1 and x1 that appears in c2, c2, you add one of these surfaces. So, if you add two handles like that to show that x1 belongs to both in c1 and c2, and you add a little bit of genus here as well. Um, you also do the same for the appearances of not x1. So in this example, not x1 appears nowhere, so you don't plug it to anything. So around here, it's really a too complex. Uh, you, there are several, there are some branching going on here. It's not at all uh, too manifold. And then you do the same for the other ones. For example, x2, it appears in c1, you do that. Not x2, it appears in c2, you do that. And you continue. And you've got this too complex here. Now what is the point of this? Well, if you are trying to solve the nut genus problem in this too complex and all three manifold, then it's fairly obvious what happens. So you're looking for a surface that has this nut as a boundary. So it starts here. And it goes on the sphere because there's nowhere else to go. And when it's here, well, it needs to choose one of the two branchings. So it can either go... Wait, what's, what's the difference between x3 and x3 bar? How, how, what's the difference between mentioning a variable and its negation? Sorry? What is the difference between mentioning a variable in a clause and its negation? Well, in the clause, so... I missed the... Uh, yeah, sorry. Here, for example, this clause is satisfied if x2 is, is false. You don't need the topological setup. In the topological, it's... You've got two things that go out of every variable. Mm -hmm. One for true, for, for when they appear positively, and why for when they appear okay. negatively. Fine, 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 fine. Okay, thank you. And now your surface is going to choose every time it sees some branching, whether you choose a positive of the negative. So it, the surface is going to choose the truth assignment that you're looking for. And everything has been well engineered. If you look at the right side, whenever you're here, uh, you're going to choose as well one of the tubes that goes in. So you're going to choose exactly one of the three literals up there. And so uh, in this case, so here, you end up with a knot of genus M plus N, if and only if the initial uh, problem was satisfiable. So this is almost it, except that this is a two complex and not a three manifold. So how do you go from a two complex to a three manifold? Well, there's a canonical way to do it. In the first step, you thicken it, which means that whenever it looks like something like that, make it a bit fatter, so now from your two complex, you have a three manifold with boundary. And then when you have a three manifold with boundary, you double it. Which means that if you start with some M, now you look at the manifold M uh, union M, where this is glued by the identity of the boundaries. Now the claim is that uh, this very uh, intuitive but unwieldy proof in here that the surface will choose the truth assignment. Not only it works in the complex, but it also works in this new second and double three manifold. And the proof relies on some degree theory that is not very hard, but I will not talk about it. 
it's just, we're just an illustration of how to prove that these things are hard. And I would just say that uh, in order to reach theorem 1 here, so the only thing that we do is you replace the not k, you do some abuse band on it. So now suddenly you're trying to embed uh, this non orientable surface into this thing, and then you do the same thing, you thicken it, and you double it. And now you need, so naturally what happens is that the non orientability it needs to go there. And so you, you try to apply the same argument, but it requires much more, much more work. So the reduction is similar, but you need to work a bit harder to prove that it works. <coughs> so that's uh, for what Hegel has in Thurston did and what we built on it. And what I'd really like to focus on in this talk is this theorem 2. Uh, so, because when you look at these things, what happens here is that this is really not R3. Like you've got a ton of of genus in the complex somehow, and then when you double and thicken it, you've got a ton of homology. So this kind of reduction really is of no use if you're trying to study problems that are really in R3. And this is why we have to figure out something very different for that embeddability problem. And actually, so what we prove is a bit stronger than what was written over there. So uh, we prove that Embeddability of these three manifolds with boundary tori in R three isn't the hard. So this is uh, a subcase of what was written here. Here we only care about embedding three complexes. So three manifolds with boundary tori. There are some specific examples of three complexes. Um, I should say that this theorem here also implies the one for two complexes because of the of the PL to P theorem that says that uh, basically if you take a good enough subdivision of the two skeleton of this thing, uh, the embedding problem is equivalent. This is hidden under the right for this talk, and I would like to focus on this. So how do you prove that this thing is hard when you do the same as before? You start from some, yes, was that a question? <laughs> no, I just did your class. My class, sorry. Uh, so you do the same as before. You start with some satisfiability instance, and you try to embed it in that problem. So as before, we have some variables, x1, x2, Xn, some closes, C1 up to Cm. And we will use the following objects. So for every variable, you look at the following link. Is this one three or is this just very side? That's regular. So for every variable, you will build something like that, and so in your mind, it doesn't mean anything for now, but you should think as one of these unknots here as representing the positive literal and one as representing the negative literal. Now, for every clause, you will do some Borromian rings. And I'm bad at drawing Borromian rings. Think as each of these unknots, 
one represents x, one represents y, and one represents z. Now what you will do is whenever you've got something that matches here, you bend them together. So this x here is bended to this x here. And so let's say that this one was a if this one is a not y, then it will be bended to a not y that is over there for the other variable. So each one of these rings is bended once, and these ones can be bended many times because of that. And then you will do one last thing. So for now, we we'll, we'll, we'll only have a link, and it's not a 3 manifold with boundary. So to turn it into a 3 manifold with boundary, and every one of these things, we do a 3 over 2 surgery. And for everything else, we drill it out. So this gives this kind of picture. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You advance some, so you just do one. Yeah, the, the ambiguity is, but you do anything you want. Okay. So you've got your Borromean rings, and they are linked to the variables. And this 3 over 2 means that you drill it out, that you do a 3 over 2 surgery. And the empty set means that you drill it out. So this thing is some 3 manifold M5 with boundary. And the claim is that um, M5 embeds in R3, if and only if uh, phi is satisfiable. So where does that come from? Well, <coughs> one direction is much easier than the other one. And it's this direction. So if you start with some satisfying truth assignment, how do you find your bending into R3? Well, for example, let's say that, uh, I actually I don't know what is the satisfying assignment for this example. But let's say that, uh, all of the literal true makes a satisfying assignment. I don't know if that's the case here. Yes, that's the case. Okay. Uh, then, if t is true, what you will do is that you will fill the torus that was filled out with a 1 over 0 surgery. What happens when you fill uh, the link comp component with a 1 over 0 surgery? Well, it means that the drilling out was you remove a torus and then you feel exactly the same torus in the same way in it. So it's like it's, it just disappears from the picture when you do a 1 over 0 surgery. So if you do that on T, then this disappears and this disappears, and suddenly your Borromean rings, they unravel. They're not linked anymore because they need to have the three of them to be linked. So these ones, they unravel. So if you have a satisfying assignment, it means that in each of the Bor Borromean rings, one of the things will disappear. So everything will nicely unravel, and you will just end up with the things up there. And what are the things up there? Well, you will get things like that, uh, a bunch of things like that. So one has disappeared because it was filled with one over zero, and then you've got this, and you've got many copies of this. And then, so the question is just finding a good dead filling of this one so that you end up with S3. And for this specific problem, I claim that 1 over 1 will work. And you can check, so maybe using some Kirby calculus or whatever tool you like, you can check that this thing actually gives S3. So if I, I mean, that thing's, a, that thing's, if you don't fill, then yes. it's just a solid torus. It's really natural to connect some solid torus and that. A lot of these might be banded together, right? So it could be linked with multiple three halves curves. But the bending only goes to the Borromean rings. And the Borromean rings, they disappear. Right, but like maybe in the bottom left Borromean rings, maybe Y was banded to two different things that are. No, because like every single thing here is only banded to one thing, the one they go to. Oh, that's right. Because of this 
simple trick of using the ball Riemann ring. Uh, this kind of uh, simple relation seems very attractive. And then it's more tricky to prove that it actually works. So you also need to study the other direction, which is that if this object embedded in R3, then from that you can deduce some satisfying assignment. And what you'd like to claim is that, well, the only way that this thing embeds in R3 is the way that I outlined here, which means that for each of these things, exactly one of them is filled with one over zero. And these ones you can use as a truth assignment. And that turns out to be a more delicate question because uh, studying which fillings give a given manifold, it's not that easy of a question, especially, so if you work with knots, then you know that there's a single, by the God of Lucas theorem, there's a single filling that gives us that gives us three. If you work with links, then there are many possible fillings that might give the same thing. Uh, we need to work quite harder to make it work. So, how do we do that? that the pretty much the idea of bedding is the one we look for. So to help us in that task, uh, we start by using the Fox free embedding theorem that say that if in our case this M5 embeds in S3, I should say uh, I switch between R3 and S3 because they're the same except if your input manifold is S3 or embedded it. So if M5 embedded S3, then there exists an embedding such that the components are handle bodies. <laughs> and since we have bothered it, <coughs> so these are actually solid to arrive. And so this means that there exists an embedding that is exactly uh, obtained by doing some dead fillings on the boundary. So that's good for us. And then the idea of the proof is the following. So um, whenever you have these variable gadgets, you are going to look at a natural genus two surface that appears around it. For every viable gadget. So actually this these things they go to the Borromean ring and they come back and the surface follows them. So you have a surface and so we've got a family of surfaces and well, if it embeds in S3, it means that the union of these surfaces, uh, they can be compressed until you get spheres. And this compression, well, what we would like to prove is that there are the ones that are expected. What are the ones that are expected? Well, one of the compressions should be Let's say a compression disk here, which is doable because this thing will be filled with 1 over 0. And then once that's the case, this hole will be will turn out to be empty. Um, and we can see it <coughs> because suddenly all the Borromian rings have unraveled. So what we would like to prove. Wait, so the, the GS2 surface is a regular neighborhood. So it goes around the task yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the two other things. And, but the two other the variables have now have been banned some yeah, crazy so it's way, but so the genus 2 surface goes there as well. It follows everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in particular, if it goes inside the Borromean ring, there's no obvious compression in the middle because the Borromean, <coughs> Borromean ring stands in the way. So what we want to prove is that this surface Sx for example, it does not compress outside. We want the first compression to be inside to force this one to be a 1 over 0. So 
and then we want to prove that uh, the early inside compression is the one that we want. So because there was some one over zero feeling. And if we can do that, well, basically, this would be enough. And Wait, it, it doesn't have an obvious compression to the outside, but it might be compressive. It might be. For the outside, because you've filled some fillings on the other components of the Roman rings as well. So the way you think of it, you try to compress all the surfaces at once. So you're not allowed to cross the other surfaces. Mm -hmm. But there might still be things. And actually, there are. So that doesn't work. So there are some pathological configurations. And that does not work as well. <laughs> we tried for a long time to make it work, and there are some bad things happening. So the, the way we run it is to actually use harder constructions, so more complicated objects, to make sure that bad things do not happen. So what are examples of these harder things? Well, instead of linking things nicely in the middle like that, we use one that is a bit more annoying, like this. So what is the point of this one? Well, so if we now, so we still look at the at the surface that goes around all these things, and I claim that locally it looks a bit like this thing. So here you have a, an embedding of some graph in R3. And the good thing about this graph is that uh, the theorem of uh, Kishimoto, Oriyuchi, and Suzuki that say that the complement of this graph has incompressible boundary. exactly what we need here because when you look at the surface that goes around all these things and you look at whether it admits some outside compression well this surface is exactly the same as the one you obtain when you drill out a small neighborhood of this. And so because of this theorem you can naturally rule out all the outside compressions in this thing. So then we need step two and so for step two uh, is that in that picture? No? You make things a tiny bit more complicated as well. So instead of having these things, so now this one has changed, but for now I simply threw it like that. We cable the nuts inside. What's the point of this? Well, now this, this simple thing will rule out some bad compressions inside that were happening before. <coughs> so, as before, we do this, and then we, bend, we need to bend things to the to the Boronian rings. So the picture looks like this. So 
you do that the other way. You start by bending and then you double. Then I would just, I'm running out of time, so I would just say roughly how this works. Uh, okay, this. Um, so now, you still look at the same genus two surfaces, you know, here. And there's this clasp. So I don't draw the complicated clasp because basically it only modifies what happens outside. If you look inside the surface, uh, it's still pretty much the same thing. And now, so I look at compressible as compressing discs inside this thing. To make my life a bit easier, I will drill out tori around the cable nuts. So now, and remember that on the clasp, there was some three over two surgery. That's one thing I haven't said. So first thing we need to do is to verify that uh, the easy direction still works with the multiple cable nuts. And this you can prove, for example, with some curvy calculus as well, or if you have some better intuition than me, then maybe it's a Things like that. So the way uh, it works is that we say, well, we first argue that this surface is incompressible inside. If we had drilled out the red torus, this red torus, and a small torus around the clasp. And then you'd like to argue that doing this 3 over 2 surgery around the clasp uh, does not change this incompressibility. And for that, we can use some technical work. So there's a very useful lemma in the paper of Keller, uh, Gordon, Lucas, and Shannon. Uh, we not state, but basically it says that when, if the one where everything is drilled out uh, is incompressible and there is some analysis with some slope on the clasp, uh, then if you do a surgery that is far away from the slope on the clasp, then it things still stay compressible. So it's like that. So here we have an, an analysis that touches the clasp like that, so that's a zero, zero over one slope. And so the theorem basically says that if delta of 3 over 2, um, 0 over 1 is bigger than 1, then the surface stays incompressible after the 3 over 2 surgery. Compressing disk, it should enter this tori here. And so there should be a compressing disk of the tori. And now the good thing is that the space that is inside the tori, when you do a dead filling of the, on the and nuts, it's a, it's a cable space, so it's well understood. And there's another black box that is Gordon Lissalem that pretty much classifies all the compressing disks happening inside this tori. Uh, so it says for any choice of filling, there is such a compressing disk that gives such a boundary slope outside. And using in combination this one and this one, we can rule out all the bad cases in this, uh, in this thing. So, yeah, this is a bit sketchy, but basically using these two black boxes, what we end up at the end is that we've got a family of double genus surfaces that compress the way you expect, 
until at the end there are spheres. And what you'd like to prove, remember, if we go back to the start, is that uh, where was it? Maybe that was yeah. I want to prove that if it embeds, then the formula is satisfiable. So what is the truth assignment? Well, these things tell you that one of the exactly one of these should be filled with one over zero. That will be your true. And then you need to verify that it's satisfiable. So at every Borromean ring, you should verify that at least one of the things has been assigned true. And the point is now you have spheres that go around all the links. And if none of them have disappeared because of a one over zero thing, then you have spheres that split your Borromean ring. And that cannot happen. So that's how you finish the argument. Uh, to conclude, I would just say two things. So why is uh, this can be safely be extended to embeddings into some more complicated three manifolds. And one thing for which it works is if you care about irreducible heteroidal three manifolds. Then that works. In particular, it's actually hard to embed, uh, to decide the availability of some two-dimensional thing into a hyperbolic manifold. So you're in a manifold space. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what I wanted to say to finish is that so I think this kind of picture. So here it was more problem on embedding manifolds, etc. But I think this trick with Borromean rings can be very useful to studying other problems uh, on knots and links. And for example, so we're working on proving that the unlinking and the unlocking number uh, are hard using these kind of tricks as well, because really that's what happens to unlink things, and there's some intricate way that relates the way you unlink things with the satisfiability problem. This kind of thing should work. And hopefully, so we started, we, we've always wanted to solve knot equivalence, to show that knot equivalence is hard, so we don't know how to do it yet, but that's progress. Thanks. Are there any questions for the speaker? Yes? Yeah, so is this enough, or is it not enough to tell you that detecting not complements is hard? Well, these are not not complements. There are many on the retori. And actually, uh, yeah, so that's something we don't know. Can, we, can you do something like that with a single boundary Uh Well, it should be a worse than actual time. We discussed this yesterday. Yes. Yeah, that should be an MP. Right. But is it equal MP? Or is it MP hard? Uh, yeah, it's a matter of opinion. Yes? Would it be harder? Yeah, of course, it should be harder. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, there's not a single, I think, example of more hard reduction in three manifold theory. Yeah. Maybe if you consider sharp PRNS to be harder than PRNS, there is, but um, some NX PRNS of this kind of thing would be very good. Or polynomial hierarchy, yeah. I don't know that something that would be good. Well, would it, I mean, would it be the case that, that to certify that it embeds, you just you, you give the fillings? And then yeah. use the fact that three zero recognition is in NP. But you need to bond the, the side of the feelings. Hmm. Which question are you asking? <laughs> whether it's an NP, like whether it's NP complete or whether it's oh, this, this question. harder than sorry. This question was yeah. the, the 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 techniques for embedding, just checking that something's not it's not going to generalize. It's very different than the other because you're in. Okay. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. no, let's thank the